de ahí. The series of messages that God has been giving us is about when Jesus was on this earth and he said, you have heard it said. And then he talked about something that had been said. Then Jesus said, but I say to you. And then Jesus said something that they needed to hear. So we've been looking at these. And today we're in our, <clears throat> this is our fourth message. And at the end of each message, We found that Jesus was criticizing them for their traditions in their church. And we have looked at those traditions, some of them, in our current churches. The first one we looked at was baptisms. <clears throat> we have a member in this church. Her husband passed away last year, unfortunately. But they moved a lot, Charlotte. And... Um, They attended various churches. He was baptized five times. <laughs> Because every church he went to said, you can't be a member of our church unless we baptize you. And of course, that's not in the scripture. So we talked about that, looked at it, how that there's just one baptism, one spirit, and, and it puts us in one body. Then we looked at Easter, and we saw how that Easter was not celebrated by the New Testament church until quite some time after uh, the apostles and the disciples were living. And so uh, the early church, it wasn't until almost uh, 300 AD that when um, Constantine made Christianity a state religion, that they decided that they would merge a pagan worship of the sun god with the Sabbath, uh, with the Passover worship of the Lamb of Jesus. So they merged the two. And so what they did, they ended up moving um, uh, that Passover and they ended up bringing in the sun god. And so they changed it the name to Easter, which is one of the gods, of the pagan gods, the sun gods, and they moved it over and did away with the name Passover. And they moved the worship of that day to Sunday, which is the day that they worship the pagan god. So we had Christianity merging with the world and with pagans. So we took a look at that. And then we spent some time looking at the Sabbath. And if you look at the notes that are in your bulletin you'll see that we separate here as they do in scripture the Ten Commandments which is this orange box and the law of Moses those are not the same things so the Ten Commandments we saw the fourth one is to uh, honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy and so we know that Jesus fulfilled the law of Moses but the Ten Commandments are still in existence so that's where we are in the series of messages And the one today, Jesus is going to talk about prayer and fasting. And then he's going to criticize the religious leaders for what they're doing. We're going to also make an application to our church here. Um, so we want to look at Matthew 6, 5 through 18. I'll give you a chance to turn there if you'd like. Matthew 6, 5 through 18. And we're going to break that into two groups of scripture. <clears throat> the first one is about prayer, and the second one is about fasting. In Matthew 6, verses 5 through 14, let's see what Jesus was saying to the religious leaders. Matthew 6, 5, beginning in 5. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corner of the streets. Why? So they can be seen by men. This is Matthew 6, verse 5. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. <clears throat> There were people 
in the leadership of church in that day who would stand up in church and pray. There were people in that day, leaders in the church, who would stand out on the street corner and pray. And their whole purpose was, look at me. Look at me. Look how I pray. Aren't I really something? And they were focused on themselves. In verse 6, Jesus said, But you, when you pray, you go into your room. You shut your door. You pray to your Father in secret. And your Father who sees in secret is going to reward you openly. Do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. They think they're going to be heard by their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. Your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask. So Jesus is concerned that people aren't praying from their heart. People are praying to get attention, to get accolades, to be told, what a great prayer that was, Edie, or whoever was praying it. And, that, and that's what they wanted. Jesus said, you get your reward, and it comes from men. But you won't get your reward from the Father in heaven if you pray that way. So we're told, pray in secret. Keep your prayers uh, away from public. Don't, don't stand out on the street corner and pray. And he even ends by, Jesus ends by saying, you know what, before you even pray, God already knows what you need before you even pray it. Now you go ahead and pray it. But you don't have to go on and on and on and on and on. He knows what you need. Now, in your notes, <clears throat> I've noted uh, three things for both of these, prayer and fasting. Number one is no. <laughs> Jesus said no public display. No. Do not pray like that in public. But he said yes. Pray in private. Pray in secret. Pray to God in your room. The reward, you can either choose to be rewarded by men or be rewarded by God. If you want to be rewarded by men, you go out on the street corner. You go, go down here in the lobby. Just start praying. Jesus said no. If you want to be rewarded for God, you go pray in secret. He already knows what you need. And then he gave them what we, some people call the Lord's Prayer, the Disciples' Prayer, really, is what it was. And he taught them how to pray, and it's the Lord's Prayer. And I think everybody probably has been through the Lord's Prayer. Now let's look at verse 15, because Jesus goes on to another thing that he sees. And he's talking about fasting. <clears throat> verse 16. When you fast, now what this means is you don't eat anything. You drink water, you drink juices, but you don't eat anything. And there can be short fasts, there can be medium length fasts. Uh, some people will fast. Uh, Jesus actually fasted 40 days in the wilderness before he started his ministry. But he says, moreover, when you fast, don't eat. Don't be like the hypocrites. Now here, here those people go again. When they fast, they have a sad countenance. In other words, it, it, if I saw you, I would say, what's wrong with you? What's going on? Is there anything I can do to help you? Because they would just, oh boy, oh gee, oh. You know, that's the way they fasted. And then when people said, what's wrong with you? You go, oh, I'm fasting. <laughs> I'm fasting. I've been without food. Oh my goodness. And they would go through this whole routine. They disfigure their faces and they appear to be fasting. They're, that isn't what fasting is. Fasting is not eating, focusing on God, praying to God, and trying to hear from God during that time. That's what fasting is. We were in a Bible study. Oh, it's been a couple years ago. And fasting came up, <clears throat> and this is because of misunderstanding what fasting is. 
one of the people in the Bible study spoke up and he said, well, I, th I fast. Uh, when I want to fast, I don't have any problem fasting. I, I just, I fast on Sunday, and I said, well, okay, that's great. How do you fast? I don't watch golf on TV, he said. <laughs> and I look, we all looked at him like, that's fasting? No, 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 that's not fasting. Fasting is you wouldn't eat anything, and you would be in prayer to God during the day, you know. But people have funny ideas about what fasting is, but it's not eating food. And what it does, it takes the attention off of you and it allows God to speak more clearly to your heart. That's what fasting's for. He says in verse 16, they have their reward, just like the, the ones who pray in the open. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. You should not even appear to be fasting. But to your Father who's in secret, he is the one who will reward you openly. So praying and fasting, Jesus said, is not to be done so that people pay attention to you or me. It's to be done so that you pay attention to God. That's what that prayer is all about. Okay? And fasting is all about. So they had it all wrong. And they were teaching people the wrong. That's what Jesus was most concerned about. They were teaching people this. So those are the two uh, uh, foundational truths that, j that is in our message today. Now what we want to do is continue with looking at one oral tradition that began in the church. And uh, before I get into this in detail, I, I just want, I want to remind all of us that <clears throat> that I, I, what I teach and what I believe, I, I want it to come straight from the Bible. And so I'll try to do that. And if I get off track, I know there's people that will get me back on track. But that's, that's my interest, is obviously, is following God's Word, doing what God said. And so this, this tradition that we're going to look at, we're going to look at the history of it and how it came about, and we're going to look at what it does and what it doesn't do but the main focus is we want to know what we as a church are supposed to do. And this topic is tithing. And um, what we're going to find out as we look at Scripture is that the church today is expected to give of our finances. We are expected to support God in His work. And He uses us and our finances to do that. He also uses our finances to support each other, to support the ministry, to support the poor. All of that is through gifts, and, and we're going to see how that the early church did that. Um, but they didn't tithe. As a matter of fact, nowhere until way past the second century did any church tithe. Okay, And we're going to see that this was part of the law of Moses. Now, uh, Galatians 3.24 says that the law of Moses, and that's this black box up here, was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So in other words, it went out in the neighborhood before school and gathered all the children. That's what the schoolmaster did. And it's usually a he. And he would take those children to the school and hand them over to the teacher. So that was the job of the schoolmaster. Well, that's the job of the law of Moses, if you want to think of it that way. It gathered people together, and it pointed them to Jesus, and it, it, it brought them along, and when Jesus came, he fulfilled that law. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law of Moses. I came to fulfill it. And so that's what he did. So now in this century... As we look at this scripture, we are, know that because we are under a new covenant and the blood of Jesus, we are no longer required to serve the law of Moses. We're no longer required to do that. Now the Ten Commandments continue until heaven and earth pass away, Jesus said. But the law of Moses, Jesus fulfilled it. 
when he died on the cross. And just to show you that we believe that, we don't do sacrifices of animals for our sin, do we? We don't raise animals and kill them in order to offer a burnt offering to forgiveness of sin, which is what they did here in the Law of Moses. And the reason we don't is because Jesus took the place. Jesus fulfilled that. His blood now is sufficient for our forgiveness of sins. So we don't have to do that. As a matter of fact, we don't have to do anything under the Law of Moses because Jesus fulfilled it. Okay? B, I'm looking at 3B. Gentiles are not under the law of Moses. And I'm talking about Gentiles who come to the Lord. Let's, let's turn to Acts 15 just for a minute. I don't know if you remember the story. You probably do. You know, Paul was sent out to the Gentiles. And we had people who weren't Jews who were becoming Christians. And do you know what the Jews who became Christians were telling those Gentiles who became Christians? You know what they were telling them? You can't be a Christian, Mr. Gentile, or Miss Gentile, unless you become a Jew. You've got to be circumcised, which was the covenant. And so they were following Paul everywhere Paul went, and he was teaching we're not under the law of Moses. We're under a new covenant with Jesus Christ. Everywhere he went teaching, I'd hear they came behind him going, oh, oh, oh no, let me tell you, Nels, you can go ahead and become a Christian if you want to. We don't have any problem with the Gentile becoming a Christian, but you have to become a Jew. That's part of being a Christian. So this got into a big discussion in the church. And in Acts 15... The church met in Jerusalem. All the apostles and the leaders of the church met. And they met to seek God about how do we take care of this issue. What's the truth here? Verse 22. Then it pleased the apostles and elders. I'm in Acts 15, verse 22. It pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, and namely Judas, who was also a Bar Bar Barsabas, and, and uh, Silas, leading men among the brethren. So the, the people at Jerusalem, the, the leaders, the apostles, had, they had made a decision, and they were going to send that decision down to the Gentiles. Did you think they wrote them a letter and said, guess what? <laughs> We're glad to have you be Christians, but you have to become Jews. No, that isn't what they said. We can read what they sent in the letter, verse 23. This is the letter. Apostles and elders and the brethren to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. So these are Jewish Christians, leaders in the church, writing new Gentile Christians. Verse 24, Since we have heard that from some who went out from among us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls. See, it was unsettling to a Gentile to think, well, I just gave my life to Christ, and now they're telling me I've got to be circumcised to begin with. <laughs> That's pretty painful. And then I'm going to not only have to be circumcised, but I'm going to have to follow the old law. And it unsettled them. It would unsettle me if somebody told me that. You must be circumcised and keep the old law, to whom we gave no such commandment. In other words, the apostles said, they might have come out and told you we said that. We never said that. We never said, you new Gentile Christians have to follow the law. So it seemed good to us in verse 25, being assembled with one accord to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report these things by word of mouth to you. For it seemed good, now listen, 
it, it wasn't just us. They said it seemed good to who? The Holy Spirit. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. I can't wait to read what they did tell them they had to do then because they did lay some things on them. And here's what they laid on them in verse 29. Abstain from things offered to idols. Abstain from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. Do you know what pagan worship, a lot of it, almost all of it, you know what people did during pagan worship? Hmm? They offered things to idols. They drank blood. They strangled things as part of their worship service. Even children, even killed children, drank children's blood. And they and the there weren't just priests in their pagan temples, there were priestesses who made themselves available sexually to the men. And so if you're going to be a member of that church, you had to have sexual relations with these priestesses in these pagan temples. Why in the world would the apostles and the elders at Jerusalem write about that to these new Gentile Christians because in their previous life if they were pagan that's what they had participated in and so and that's that's against God for sure and so all they told them was you stay away from these things that you used to do in these pagan temples because if you eat blood and if you eat things that have been strangled and you eat what normally you ate there, you will be reminded of your old life. So we encourage you, you stay away from those things. And then they wrote one last word. One sentence. In verse 29 at the end of it. And they told them, keep the old law. Keep the law of Moses. Right? No. They said farewell. <laughs> farewell. We'll see you. God be with you. They did not tell the Gentiles, you keep the old law. Because the old law had been fulfilled at this time. And there was no reason to tell them that. So, <clears throat> we're at, uh, in point three, Gentiles were not under, to be new Gentile converts to Christ were not to be under the law of Moses. All believers in Jesus then are not under the law of Moses. Let's turn to Romans 3 and start in verse 19. Romans 3, 19. Three nineteen. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. See, the law of Moses was only written to those that were under the law of Moses. The only people that were under the law of Moses were the Israelites. That's who had to keep the law of Moses. Now why? that every mouth might be stopped and all the world may be guilty before God. You see, the law was a schoolmaster and it brought us to Christ. What the law did, it said, Gary, you know what? You are a filthy, sinful human being. That's what the law said. And here's the reason you are, because you don't, you don't, for one, you don't keep the Ten Commandments. And for number two, you actually violate the law of Moses. So you're, you're in sin. And, and, and that's what the law did. It said this is what sin is and so you're in sin. Therefore by the deeds of the law no flesh will be justified as in, in his sight for the law is the knowledge of sin. That's all the law does. It just says you're a sinful being. And, and that hurts your relationship with God. 
And so they offer sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. Blood, 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 blood. Can you imagine what that altar looked like that those priests offered those sacrifices? It's just blood. Because without blood, the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Now verse 21, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and all who believe, there is no difference. What he's saying is, all of that need for forgiveness of sin was was fulfilled and finalized in Jesus Christ. And His blood, once for all, took care of all of this. And so this law, this law was fulfilled at that time when Jesus resurrected from the dead. Luke 22, 20. Let's read that verse real quick. Well, I'll go through these scriptures fairly quickly. You'll have time to look at them when you uh, this week we're going to look at Luke 20 22 this is Jesus I have the right scripture Luke 22 verse 20 I'll get it okay Jesus is getting ready to be crucified he's having his last meal with his disciples verse 20 he took the cup after supper and he said, this cup is the new covenant, so it's not the old covenant, it's not the old law. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. So Jesus is telling them, my blood on the cross, is the final sacrifice that's needed for any forgiveness of sin. All you have to do is just accept the fact that that's what Jesus did and that's who He is. And your sins are forgiven in the past, in the present, and it can be forgiven in the future. You see. And so all of a sudden, all of these ceremonies, all of these ordinances, all of these things that they had to do under the law of Moses, all of a sudden was fulfilled through Jesus Christ. Let's look at uh, James 2. We're going to uh, be looking at 8 through 10. James 2, 8 through 10. If you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. See, that's in the law of Moses. You shall do well. But, verse 9, if you show partiality, you commit sin. And you are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and stumble in one point, he's guilty of all of it. Do you realize that this little black box that has all kinds of ordinances and ceremonies, and if you kept every single one of those except one little one, you were guilty of the entire law. Guilty of it all. And so James is trying to to convince these Christians that he's writing to, don't go back under the law. Don't. Be under Jesus. Be under the blood of Jesus, not the blood of bulls and goats. Now, <clears throat> I gave you a, a handout in your bulletin, and this is for you to look at this week. I'm, I'm not going to take time to go all the way through this. <clears throat> but I am going to just take a minute to explain how tithes happened in the Old Testament. There was one of the twelve tribes called Levites. They did not get any land in Canaan. None. However, <clears throat> 
God said that they were allowed to live basically around 24 of the main cities. And they could raise cattle and they could use that land to grow crops. And they could stay on that land, but they didn't own it. They didn't own it. And so, every year, farmers and those who raised cattle would take a tenth of what they raised, or the tenth animal that comes under the stick, they call it, the tenth one, and they would bring those to all these Levites in these 24 areas, and they would give them to these Levites. And those Levites were charged by God to take care of, first they took care of the tabernacle, but later they took care of the temple. Okay. Out of those Levites were selected by God priests. And the Levites would take one-tenth of the tenth that was given them, and they would give that tenth of a tenth, which ends up being one percent, they would give that to the priests. And the priest lived off of that. So if you fished, or if you made weapons, or if you were a carpenter like Joseph and like Jesus, you didn't pay any tithe. It was only those who grew crops and raised animals. And God actually says in Deuteronomy, and I've given you the scriptures, that you pay that tenth on the increase only. Not on the full uh, crop or the full amount of animals. You pay it on the increase. What that means is that God wanted tithes paid on what He provided people, either as food or as animals. Now, if you were raising animals and you had nine oxen and they all passed under the rod to pay a tithe, the tenth one was God's. Well, you didn't have a tenth one. So you, you didn't give any of your oxen. It was the tenth one. <clears throat> if you had eleven, you gave the tenth one that, that went under. That was part of your tithe. <clears throat> All of this was to help take care of the, the Levites and the priests who took care of the tabernacle and took care of the temple. That was the purpose for the tithe. Nobody outside of Israel was required to pay the tithe. Jews who were outside of Israel were not required to pay the tithe. First two years, who, if you were in Israel and you were a farmer or you raised animals, you paid the tithe. On the third year, all the tithes were brought together in Jerusalem, and all the families would come to Jerusalem, and they would have a feast and a celebration, and they would eat the tithes. Everybody. They celebrated. And the Levites invited the poor during that third year. And all the poor were provided for. So these tithes were, the purpose for them was, was an inheritance then to the Levites. And it was paid on the increase. <clears throat> now what happened if you neglected those tithes? This is a scripture that's used in all churches, Malachi 3, that, that want to put people under the tithe in the church. Malachi 3, what happens? Well, let me tell you what was happening. The Levites were being brought the tithes, and they were supposed to pay a tenth of that to the priest, and they didn't do it. This Malachi 3 was written to those Levites. That's why it's so strong. That's why he says, I, the devourer is going to come after you. I'm not going to hold the devourer back. Here you are, Levites, and you're not even providing what I gave you to provide to the priests. And, and so God, uh, he allowed Satan to, to, to run rampant. <clears throat> now, the big question ends up being, uh, let me go over one other thing with you. 
In 567, the Catholic Church had started. And the Catholic Church says, you know what? We've got buildings now. We've got priests now. We need to take care of these people. And so they wanted everyone to pay 10%, everyone to pay 10% of everything they had to the Catholic Church to pay for all this. And then in 585, the Catholic Church made it a requirement. You want to be a member of the church, you do this. If you don't do this, you know what happened to you? You get excommunicated. You get kicked out of the church. And in, in some cases, uh, they, they would teach, you know, you lose your salvation because of that. From that point on, to take care of buildings and finances and all kinds of things that they were building and they were expanding as the Catholic Church, they required the tithe. But it begs the question now, well, Gary, if you're saying that nowhere in the New Testament can you find where the church paid a tithe, <clears throat> then how in the world did they take care of their needs? And that's what we're going to look at next week. <laughs> because Paul gave them explicit directions about their money and how they should give it and who they should give it to and what they should give it for. And the New Testament church followed those teachings for two, three hundred years until the, the Catholic Church and other Protestant churches began to bring that tithe from a law that was fulfilled by Jesus, bring that over. <clears throat> what you find out is that paying a tithe ends up being thought of in some cases as, as a blessing to be able to give it to God, but in other cases it becomes obedience to a law which is not in effect anymore. Because what we're going to find next week is that God expects us as a church and as members to give from the heart. Isn't that what Jesus talked about to all these people that were trying to follow the old law and they were, and they were making their own laws out of it? He said, I want, to, I, want you to do, I want you to live from the heart. We're going to see that Paul teaches that churches should give from the heart to meet needs that are in the church, that are in the community, that are the poor. And what you find out is, <clears throat> I don't owe God 10%. God has 100% of what I have. You know, I, if I owe God anything, I owe Him everything I have. He, he gave it to me. And so why out of my goodness of my heart and Jesus Christ of my heart, wouldn't I share that with people at church and poor and, and everyone else? You know, Paul even gives specific teachings about Nels and me in the scriptures that we'll look at next week. He gives specific teachings about how that, that uh, elders and pastors, shepherds who teach and serve in that capacity are worthy of double honor, he, he says. So in other words, the church should be taking care of the church and the church should be taking care of its own and the church should be taking care of the poor and we should be helping each other and help other churches but but not by just holding back 10 percent and giving it now if we decide we're going to give 10 percent there's absolutely nothing wrong with that because we're going to find next week, Paul says, that you decide in your heart how much you're going to give, and you give it cheerfully. Cheerfully. Okay? And so, 10%? You want to give 10%? You give 10%, if, if that's what God's putting on your heart to give. Okay? But what you find out is, you end up giving lots of your time. You end up giving lots of your resources. You end up giving lots of your finances to the church. Okay? And um, that's, that's the heart that Jesus wants us to be providing and, and giving of our finances. Okay? Um, because we're not under that old law. We're just not under it. 
Even though the Catholic Church and even though Protestant churches use it, and I mean they use it to make their people feel like you don't do that, God's removing His blessing from you. And we have preachers who will get up and say, if you'll pay your tithe, you will, God will just open the storehouses, you will be so rich you can't believe it. And, and, and there'll be poor people in that church who will give, like the widow, everything, the two mites. They'll give it all, and they'll stay poor. Now, what do you tell them? God doesn't do what He says He was going to do? No, you, you don't. But, in, but Paul says, you give freely, you will receive freely. You give a little, you're going to receive probably a little. You, you open your heart and you give, you're going to be overflowed with gifts from, that God is going to provide. God promises that in the New Testament to those of us who are believers. Okay? So these are uh, some, some things that <clears throat> may be difficult for us to begin to think through. But next week we're going to see, boy, when we're giving from the heart like Jesus says to give, oh my, what a burden is lifted and what opportunities we have to give, you know. Um, so um, I think everything that I presented today, I believe, is from Scripture. And I encourage you to look at these Scriptures and I'll be glad to look at them with, with you if you want to. But <clears throat> we do have an obligation under Jesus Christ to give. We are obligated. He gave us His Son. He gave us everything. How much are we going to give to support the ministry and the work of the Lord and the church? That's the question. How much? And sometimes it's just a whole lot easier to say, 10%. That's it. Once I do that, I'm done. I mean, then I've, I've met my requirements. You see? Well, that's under the old law. But your heart it is what sets the requirements for you. And, and the Holy Spirit uh, with your finances today under Jesus Christ. So, um, God bless you this week. Um, I want to ask God's blessing on this word because we've studied some, we've, we've covered a lot of history, but we've also studied some deep things that, uh, that some people, um, you know, need a little more uh, time to think about. Father, thank you for uh, putting on our hearts the fact that we're not under that old law. Thank you for reminding us again, we don't live under that law of Moses. Um, we live under Jesus Christ and the new covenant in His blood. And Father, we want to live our entire life the way He wants it under the new covenant. And we ask You to show us what that is. If it's in worship, show us how to worship. If it's in our giving, show us how to give. If it's in our relationships with each other, show us how to have those relationships in Jesus Christ. But Father, we do pray that You will warn us and you will put out a hand to stop us if we find ourselves entering into traditions that are, are brought down through history by people who have other ideas about why we should be doing that. Just give us some truth, Lord. Help us to see it and, and, and protect us and our hearts as we serve you in the name of Jesus. We thank you. Amen. Amen.